Lord Desai, it's wonderful to welcome you here to the Business School of the University of Edinburgh and this uh, in yet another talk on the um, Adam Smith Global Economic Series of the Asia Scotland Institute. I'm enormously grateful to you for coming all the way here. I know that you were in Cambridge yesterday at the Cambridge Union and, and not so long ago you were in Goa because that was where I tracked you down. Uh, I know that a number of people are looking forward to hearing your views on what's going on in India and the Indian economy, whether uh, it's in free fall or whether this is a pause. And I know that you once described to me the difference between India and China was that China was like a porcelain vase which could crack at any moment, but India was like a great big mud pie, quite immovable and it would continue whatever. Yeah. So perhaps you could share some thoughts with, with me yeah. on what you feel. Yeah, no, and it's very nice to be here. Edinburgh is one of my favorite cities and Adam Smith, of course, is a great man. Uh, no, I think, you know, what one has to look at uh, the present uh, situation in India as uh, an age of transition. There are several transitions going on. There is a shortfall in growth, there is high inflation, but that is more due to the politics rather than any fundamental economic problems. After the election, some of the political uncertainty will be removed. Mm. And in one sense, if one of the two major parties wins, either Congress comes back or BJP, BJP wins, yeah. then uncertainty is reduced. Uh, and the growth will resume, growth will go up by one or two percentage points. Mm -hmm. So one would get back to about seven, seven and a half. The question is, can India do eight and a half, nine? Yes. And that depends upon which government, which party wins the power. And especially, I don't think Congress has it in it any longer to do many more reforms. And I think BJP is hungry for power and they have the energy. Mm -hmm. They have a dynamic leader, and it looks like they will probably win, and the growth will resume. What happens if there's a coalition? Well, the third possibility, you know, they, they, both those parties, if they win, they'll form a coalition. Right. But the two major parties have seats in triple figures. The next one would be under 40, uh -huh. number of seats under 40. Yes. So you have, as it were, two bigish, uh, 130, 180 sort of range uh, seats. And then there are people 30, 20, 10, and so on. Now, you need 273 to form a government. So if someone gets, uh, say Congress gets 150, they need lots of partners. The myth is that BJP needs more than Congress because they can get fewer partners. Yeah. So BJP will get about 180, 190 in my view, and they'll find the partners. But if neither of the major parties have enough seats, and we have what's called a third party coalition, that is a very unstable situation. Yes, <coughs> Either the big parties forming government, five years is guaranteed. Mm -hmm. And you have some semblance of order and uh, sort of policy making uh, determination. Uh, I'm of the opinion that one of the two parties will win, I think most probably BJP. Yeah. So we don't have to worry too much about a third party coalition. If a third party coalition comes into power with outside support by Congress or BJP, that government will last two years. <coughs> we started this institute last year on the basis that, that I and others believe that there was an opportunity to sort of wake up or reawaken in the Scots, mm. uh, young Scots, uh, what their forefathers had, which was this extraordinary um, spirit of adventure and travel. Mm. Uh, earlier today, yeah. you and I talked about this, the influence of Scots in India. Mm. Mm. First of all, I would like your view on whether you think our initiative is a good one, and secondly, your comment on how Scots are perceived in India. Well, you know, of course it's, it's a great initiative, but, you know, in a sense, if you go back to the Scottish Enlightenment and writing of uh, Adam Ferguson, and Adam Smith and people like that, they were also interested in the contrast between what used to be prosperous India and China, yeah. which are, as it were, stagnated, and fast-growing Western European nations. And they wanted to understand that. Today, we may have a reverse situation. Yes. We have a prosperous but somewhat stagnant or slowly growing 
developed countries in the West yeah. Yeah. and rapidly growing countries. So you know, it's an interesting contrast. And you know, Scotland, India's story is so rich and it needs to be told in much greater detail because uh, 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 in a way, um, Adam Smith, for example, was uh, very critical of what East India Company was doing, and he's very critical of the Bengal famine. Yes. I mean, he writes about it in the Wealth of Nations. Uh, and uh, so James Stewart, uh, a man whom he, whom he never mentioned, but who wrote the first principles of political economy in 1767, he, he being a Jacobite, he exiled himself to Montpellier. Yeah. And he was asked by East India Company to analyze why there was inflation in Bengal. And sitting in his off rooms in Montpellier, he wrote a brilliant report on why there was inflation in Bengal. Uh, <laughs> and that was the first economist employed as a consultant uh, by, by a government. No, and of course, in, in engineering, in, in, uh, in uh, education, in archaeology, there's an enormous Scottish contribution, f banking and finance. Uh, so I think there's a rich, rich heritage to be uh, exploited. But more than that, it has to be renewed. Yes. Scotland has to renew its connection with Asia and with, uh, with India. Yeah, yeah, good. Well, thank you. It's, it's wonderful you're here. We're going to hear a great deal more from you in detail. And I know that uh, here in the Business School of the University of Edinburgh, there will be no shortage of questions later on. So thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Today.